Morning. Brant Segetti here at the National Championship Air Races in Reno, Nevada. 2023, the final time the air races are being held at this venue. We've been here for 59 years now, and it's uh, kind of a bittersweet weekend for this, but uh, things change, time moves on, and uh, it's time for us to find a new venue. So I'm standing here in front of our P-51, known as Sparky. Uh, it's been in my family now for 39 years. In April, we'll have passed 40 years with the airplane. Started out as my dad's airplane, and it's uh, been passed on to me. And I am now the current caretaker of it. Um, so it's, as I tell people, of course, and all my sisters to know, but I would, you know, trade off my sisters before I got rid of the airplane. But uh, it's, it's part of our family. It's kind of the nucleus that kind of holds all of us together. This event in particular is kind of our family reunion every year. We come up here, everybody gets together. We see people that we haven't seen in the last 12 months. And it's, it's going to be a very emotional thing at the end of the day today, knowing that we might not see some of these people for God only knows how long. So, but uh, that's that. And I guess here uh, I can explain a little bit about the Mustang and some of its history. Um, this particular airframe was built in 1944. Uh, it is an actual combat veteran. It was built in Los Angeles. It got shipped to European theater during the war. Uh, the guy that flew the airplane in the 15th Air Force was an ace. He had three, uh, excuse me, two kills in P-51s, uh, sorry, two kills in P-38s, threes in, three in P-51s. And he was uh, oversaw four different squadrons in the 15th Air Force, which I, I can't remember the numbers, but it was the Tuskegee Airmen Group, uh, the Checker Tail Clan, which they're referred to as the Candy Stripers, which on certain P-51s out there have red and silver stripes on the tail, and then the all block yellow tail airplanes. Um, so it's one of a dozen or so Mustangs that actually have notable combat history. Uh, a lot of the airplanes, uh, like the one next to us here in the pit, was a Canadian airframe, and the only service it ever saw was snow and ice in Canada. So um, it makes it somewhat unique in that respect. But um, it's powered by a, a Packard-built Rolls-Royce, well, Packard-built Merlin engine, which was a copy of the Rolls-Royce Merlin made famous in the Spitfires over in England. Uh, driving that is a 1650 cubic inch engine, goes through a big reduction mm. gear to turn our propeller. And we've got a four-bladed Hamilton standard propeller uh, to take up that horsepower. And it's about 1500-ish horsepower at rated military power of 61 inches of boost and 3000 RPM. Um, the prop assembly itself, fully built, weighs about 450 pounds. The engine weighs roughly 1500 pounds, so it's about a pound per horsepower. Um, 3000, well, yeah, 3000 RPM is stock military, and it would be a war, war emergency power. You could go up as much as 67 inches of boost with it. So the Merlin engine was really kind of a marvel. When they started out with the P-51A, it had an Allison engine in it, which didn't have the high-speed supercharger, uh, which gave the Merlin the advantage to escort the bombers all the way to Berlin and back because it could get up to the high altitudes where the Allison-powered airplanes couldn't do it. And Mustangs also had you know, a much bigger range because of the fuel load. We had 180 gallons internal in the wings. It had a 75 gallon fuselage tank and then it also had another 150 gallons outside the airplane with the drop tanks. So it made it the, the best long range airplane of the war. So uh, other than that, it's this is a stock P-51, still stock wing, built in, still with the original North American spars in it, North American fuselage, it's all original. Same lingerons it had as it when it left the factory. Some of the sheet metal stuff and fairings and things have been changed over the years just as they wear out. My dad fully restored the airplane when we got it in 1984. And you can see here in the wheel wells, it's not as it would have been during the war. He likes light gray and shiny, and so he built the airplane the way he wanted. When, uh, when he restored it back in the 80s, this was kind of the norm. It hadn't, the, the push hadn't been to restore the airplanes back to stock military configuration like when they left the factories. So that's why we have the polished doors here. And um, yeah, it's... Can you it, explain what all that stuff is? Oh boy. 
So what, what happens, There's a, you can, as you can see, there's a lot going on down here. Um, we've got coolant lines from the engine up here and oil lines that run back to our, our radiators in the back, which we'll touch on more here in a bit. But all this hydraulic plumbing and linkage and things is all stuff to make the landing gear work and keep the landing gear in the wing under high G maneuvers and whatnot. Um, they had a problem on early production P-51s where they didn't have a hook that would keep the landing gear in the wing. So that was a change from the A-model Mustangs to the Laters. And what that does, it hooks on a little pin here on the bottom of the landing gear. When the landing gear goes up, so if there's a hydraulic failure, the landing gear doesn't come out of the wing. Same with these big fairing doors. These go up and close after the landing gear goes up and seals up the bottom of the wing. And they have big hooks as well. Uh, the problem that North American figured out under high G maneuvers that the landing gear was flying out of the airplane and breaking the wings off the airplane. So that was one of the big design changes during the war. But it's hydraulic rams and valves and everything to keep the sequencing of the doors and the landing gear all tied together so you don't wind up in a situation where the door is closing and the gear is trying to go up and jams and things like that have happened to, to owners over the years but it winds up being a landing gear rigging issue. Um, but you might be able to see here like on the landing gear these were built by a company na named Manasco. Everybody during the war was in on the war effort trying to build things. Going back to our engine, our valve covers on this engine are stamped with Maytag. So everybody was part of the war effort. Anybody that had manufacturing capabilities was making parts for airplanes and for the war effort. So there's weird little names and things on tags all over the airplane that show some of the different companies that were involved. Um, it's an oleo strut landing gear, which means it's a, an oil air chamber in the landing gear to absorb the shock when the airplane uh, touches down. So when we take off, this landing gear will actually extend about 12 inches, I believe. Uh, it's a multiple disc brake, hydraulically actuated. It, and then if, as you start looking at the airplane, you can see it's got some, some beat ups here and there on it. And it's just wear and tear on the airplane, being that we painted the, year, uh, the wing 20 years ago now. Uh, but all the hardware and things we try and keep up with and replace on a semi-regular basis. Right here is where the machine guns would have been, the 350 caliber Browning air-cooled machine guns. But we put little covers on them to drop make the airplane go a little bit faster for the races. Uh, lose less horsepower and aerodynamically clean the airplane up to maintain certain speeds. So that's why those are covered up. But during the war, that would have been three machine gun barrels sticking out of there. We have a whole bunch of different speeds for the airplane. Uh, landing gear speed on this particular airplane, or actually on all Mustangs, is 150 knots or 175 miles an hour. And I try and slow the airplane down well below that when I throw it out, just for less stress. And you know, it's, we're, we're coming up on an 80-year-old airplane now. They weren't designed to last as long as they have. It was a 250-hour airframe, 50-hour engine. Here we are, 75 years later. Engines now are, my engine's got over 500 hours on it. The airframe's got almost 2,000 on it. So. If the designers were alive today, I think they would be amazed at how many of these Mustangs are still out there running around and, and how well they've survived. And one of the biggest reasons that there are so many Mustangs left is it was such a great airplane that the Air Force kept wanting to use them over and over. And the last combat Mustangs that were in service in the Dominican Republic until 1984. So it's, it, it's a remarkable airplane even by today's standards. It's got a great cruise speed. If we're going somewhere, we, I plan on cruising at 300 miles an hour at least. Sometimes, uh, like coming over the hill from where I live down in California to get here to Reno, a flight of two of us came up in P-51s together. We were doing 370 miles an hour across the ground. Now we had a good tailwind, but it just shows that how remarkable the airplane is even to this day. Um, we fly the airplane on average 15 to 20 hours a year, some years a little bit more, some years less, depending on what air shows are happening and things. Um, as everybody knows, the 2020 year really hurt a lot of people. 
as far as air shows and things and it's a lot of the air shows that we used to go to on a regular basis have have kind of gone away and they're trying to get retractioned up to get us back but it, it's been really hard so anyway we don't we don't fly nearly as much as we probably should or would like to um, as much as I I can afford as you can imagine the airplane gets kind of costly to run and operate we burn just over a gallon a minute of fuel in cruise takeoff power I'm burning three gallons a minute and climb power we're at just about two so it's uh, it's not a cheap airplane to operate uh, the engine overhaul cost right now in today's dollars is about a quarter of a million dollars so it it really depends on how much time we can get out of them on how much you want to push it and fly it and none of the high performance airplanes like to sit on the ground and things start breaking just sitting there so we try and keep the airplane exercised on a regular basis and it just helps with longevity and also with our skills so but walking around here the back of the airplane it's typical airplane we've got regular aileron controls uh, all cable actuated through the stick goes through a couple different bell cranks comes out here we've got movable a fixed trim tab on our right aileron that we can adjust and then the trim tab on the left aileron is adjustable from a trim console in the cockpit but when I move the stick you can see in here there's a little bit of a uh, there's a bell crank here that comes out to an arm and that's what actuates the aileron flaps are hydraulically actuated uh, through the hydraulic system that runs at uh, 1500 PSI uh, and if you start looking here at the wing, you'll see a couple different stiffeners and uh, things that are on the airplane. And these were also things that came on what we kind of call band-aids as the airplane kind of progressed through its development. And these are stiffeners. At higher speeds, the wing was doing some little weird twisting things. So they put these little stiffeners on to help, help with that problem. Uh, this airplane also has, was one of the first airplanes as far as I know, that had a sealed aileron. So just forward of the aileron that runs down the length of the, the, the aileron span is a canvas boot that ties to the rear spar to seal the air that's coming over the top of the wing from escaping through the aileron. Makes the ailerons lighter and more powerful as far as control goes. And I will tell you, very much so, above 300 miles an hour indicated these ailerons become very very stiff if you get the airplane up to 400 miles an hour you're gonna have both hands on the stick trying to move the ailerons it becomes so so stiff just because of the aerodynamic loads um, moving down the wing we have a couple of really big panels here on the wing this was the ammo bay so this is where the two rows of 50 caliber machine gun bullets would lay in trays and that had rollers and things that fed the machine guns. The front row, let me start over here. Let, let's see, the guns, the, so we had the three guns laid out here. The most inboard gun sat back about six inches or the length of a 50 caliber bullet. The two outer guns sat parallel to each other at the same distance. The front row of ammunition fed the two outer guns, the rear row fed the inboard gun. There was 3,600 rounds, as far as I know, in the airplane, uh, and I don't remember if that was per wing or if that was total. I think it might be total, 3,600, 1,800 per side. And what that did, when they're in a dogfight in combat, is they're shooting every fifth round in that ammo belt was a tracer round. So if you see old time movies of gun camera films of Mustangs and dogfights, you'll see what appears to be white bullets going out of the airplane. And that's what a tracer is. It's had an incendiary on it, so when it left the airplane at hypersonic, well not hypersonic, so supersonic speed, that would burn so the pilot could see where the bullets were going. When it got down to, he only saw one tracer coming out of each side of the wing, it was time to leave the fight because he's running out of ammunition. Uh, so there, there was a, a method to the madness of having the one rear gun fed off the rear belt. So it was a, a key to the pilot that's like, hey, we're running out of getting low on ammunition. We need to boogie out of here. So um, moving further inboard. So yeah, so we had ammo bay and this is what we call gun bay. Now in most Mustangs today, 
well, the older restoration Mustangs like this one, we use this as baggage. These are our baggage compartments. For racing, this particular side, this in this airplane, I've got two big water tanks in here, and I run water across our radiator and our oil cooler to help uh, keep the engine cool and happy. Um, in this bay here, you can't see it underneath here, but this is a fuel bay, and it's got a big heavy-duty rubber bladder in it. It was a self-sealing bladder, what they called it, so if it got a bullet hole through it, it has this goo in it that would go in and fill in the void so the pilot didn't lose fuel during the war. So the airplane still has the original self-sealing fuel tanks in them. It is a 92-gallon capacity for each side of the wing. And like I said, we burn about, in cruise, a gallon a minute. First hour generally sucks up about 75 gallons, and that's due to startup, taxi out, warm up, run up, take off. I figure by the time the landing gear hits the wheel wells, I've gone through 15 gallons of fuel already. So, um, 37 foot, two inch span, tip to tip on the Mustangs. Uh, some of the racing Mustangs, if we want to just walk back out here real quick, they clip the wings. This is an, an actual, what they call a production brake on the wing. So this three foot section is removable. However, the aileron was still full length. So on the hot rod Mustangs and the guys that come up here to really go fast and race, they clip the wings right there at that joint. They'll clip the aileron, add a second hinge right, or a third hinge right here, and that's how you wind up having a clipped wing Mustang. Um, moving on, there's all kinds of things on the Mustang with you start walking around and you start looking at different things. Uh, right up here, underneath the windscreen, that is an a, a emergency canopy release. If you grab that red handle and pull, the canopy is able to come off the airplane. Um, but to get in the airplane, there's also a red button here. That red button is connected to our cockpit canopy crank that depresses a dog, removes a pin, so we're able to grab this handle push that button and you can pull the panic be back on the ground. So that's exactly what that's for. Uh, moving down, as you can see, the wing blend to the fuselage is all done with aluminum fairings. And you can see these over the years, they've been kind of beat up and they're rough, but you know, what 60 year old thing doesn't have kind of bumps and bruises on it, you know? And here we are looking at 75 years almost, 80 years. So behind this panel is a a ground power plug, so if our battery is weak or we don't want to stress the airplane battery, we'll plug a 24 volt system into that and we can power the airplane's electrical system right through that door. Um, everything, the shape of the airplane, we've got fuel vents here. This is our engine breather, so this just blows out air coming out of the crankcase from the, the movement of the pistons up and down. This is part of our fuel vent system that's all tied together, so sometimes you'll see little cups on these, sometimes you don't. But that's how we keep the fuel tanks vented on the airplane. During certain performances, guys doing aerobatics and stuff, you'll see some things venting from the airplane. It's usually a little bit of gas coming out of the fuel vent system. Sitting in this area, at the bottom, right down here, you can't see it because of the, the wrapper there, is our big engine oil cooler. It's a big brass cooler, weighs about 75 pounds, and it is Gosh, we can look at it from the front here when we get there, but it's it's got to be 18 inches across, probably six, seven inches deep, multiple rows, and so that's where the oil cooler sits. Uh, and this section right here is a 350-pound radiator, just like your car has. Uh, the it's a liquid-cooled engine, not very much unlike a V8 in a, in a Chevy. It's we run coolant and water in the system. The air comes through the front mouth of the scoop, comes back here, goes through the radiator, keeps the engine temperature, the water temperature, optimally runs between 100 and 105 degrees Celsius. So boiling and just slightly above boiling. So that is probably the, the most critical system on a P-51 is the liquid cooled engine. If for some reason we get a leak or something happens, you do not have very long before the coolant pushes its way out of the engine. You overheat the engine and start burning it up. Uh, so we, we always look underneath the airplane. That's the first thing I look at every time I walk in the hangar, see if there's anything dripped on the floor. And if it's coolant, I know I'm not going flying that day. 
because we have to find the source of it and figure out where it's coming from. Um, circling back to the wing, we've got huge high lift, high drag flaps. Flap speeds in this airplane start at 425 miles an hour. The first 10 degrees flaps come out all the way down to our last flap, which is 50 degrees of flap, which is a lot of flap. You can see how big it is. It really helps slow us down, makes our approach speeds. I try and come across the fence at 110 to 115 miles an hour. Our slowest flap speed for full flaps is 165 indicated. Please don't ask me what they are in knots because I don't know. I'm an uh, airplane guy, I'm not a boat guy. so. Um, but yeah, the flaps are extremely powerful. We use 20 degrees flaps for takeoff, some guys do. I particularly like the way the airplane takes off the ground and flies with clean wing when I go to takeoff. You know, when you're going from 250 miles an hour in cruise, you start configuring the airplane to come into land, I'll pull the power back to about 25, 20 inches of manifold pressure, depending on where I am. Back, first notch of flaps, retrim the airplane, start slowing down 20 degrees of flaps to get down to our gear speed of 175 or less, throw out the gear, then it's uh, from gear speed, I'll watch my hydraulic pressure recover. After that, I'll go to flaps 30. Um, moving back, past the radiator, this section here has a big radiator exit door. This is a thermo thermostatically controlled door that's set to maintain our 100 to 105 degree temperature. It works on a little worm gear motor up here in the back of the airplane and that door controls the air coming through the radiator to maintain the proper temperature. The designers designed this thing on what they called the Meredith effect. So the air comes in at a high rate of speed through the mouth of the scoop and then through the ducting and tunneling it opens up, the air slows down to go through the radiator to make that more and more, to make that process of picking up the latent heat more efficient. And then after the radiator, it starts necking back down and accelerating the air coming out of the back of the airplane. And the designers made this basically to the number I've read and I've seen and heard talk about is this is actually contributing to 11% of the thrust of the airplane in cruise flight. The most optimum position for it to be in flight is what we call fared. So it's fared with the bottom of the airplane. If it's either, if it's closed past fared or open past fared, it's starting to become less efficient. And if this thing's all the way down full open, it'll actually slow the airplane down about 15 miles an hour. So uh, this right here originally was a battery vent. They all had uh, uh, lead acid batteries in them and it, it, it had some weird chemicals and things in it and it, it, they boiled off so we, they had to have a place for the vent to come out. Uh, this right here we have taped up to, to help make the airplane a little bit slicker for the racing is where they'd lift the airplane, you'd put a bar through it, either lift the airplane up or you could put the bar in there and you could tie the airplane down, lash it down like when they were getting transported to Europe on the ships. They'd lash them to the deck with a, a big bar and they'd moor it to the ship is what they call that. It was a lifting and mooring position. Uh, static, static port just like any airplane has with a pedostatic system in it. So we've got one on either side and that just helps maintain the, the pressure equalization for our airspeed, our altimeters, our vertical speeds. Landing gear doors for our tailwheel system. This is a fully retractable tailwheel. Goes up, closes, same thing, fares up the bottom of the airplane, makes it smooth. As you can see in the video there, it's the same thing. It's all light gray inside. It's all been restored the way my dad wanted to do it years and years ago. And it's not the norm anymore again, but it's nice. It makes inspections easy. I can look up there with a flashlight, see things. It's not the dark green and the zinc chromates that everybody uses today. It's the light gray is my preference of color because it just makes things easier. It makes maintenance really easy panels all over the place to get into various things back here in the back. We've got our up lock and our down lock for the tail gear. The hydraulics are back here. So there's inspections things when I open up, all the fairings come off, look at everything, lube things, really check it over. Uh, horizontal stabilizer is just like any other airplane. You'll see these big blocks right here. This is a counterbalance for the high speed flight of the airplane. So both elevators have this. The rudder has one as well. 
and it's just to maintain the balance of the control feather at the high speeds. Again, trim tabs, one on either side of the horizontal and the elevators. Again, all cable controlled from the trim console and the cockpit. Rudder is fabric covered, and we get that question a lot. Why is the rudder fabric covered? Early P-51s had fabric covered elevators. They eventually went to metal, and theories are is it was harder to balance the metal initially but then they figured it out by putting more weights on it the rudders just never never got converted to metal and it's just the way it was and some people seem to think that it was maybe oh it may have been for bullet holes so it's easier to repair it's just I'm I don't know the answer I've heard multiple stories and I they all sound plausible I don't know that's just the way it is same thing rudder trim tab controllable from the cockpit and the airplane's got design things built into it where any power setting, any speed change, you are constantly fiddling with the rudder trim in the airplane. The faster I go, the more left rudder I'm pushing on. And we do that because history has shown many times here at the air races, the guy who's used the rudder trim starts deflecting the tab out, much too much load on it, on its 80-year-old hinges, they fail and the rudder trim tab comes flying off the airplane. So that's why I zero mine and I just use my feet. So uh, moving back around, as you can see, you know, the airplanes all have nav lights on them, wing lights, tail lights. I don't have any other night, you know, any anything set up for night flying on this airplane, and I don't think I'd ever put myself in that situation. Um, when I got checked out in the Mustang, there was a few things that my instructor told me you never do. You never fly a Mustang at night. You never fly one in bad weather. You never go to high altitude. High altitude, the airplane's capable of going to 41,000 feet. I have been to as high as 18,000 feet in the airplane and I absolutely froze. I don't know how guys during the war, other than having the heaters and, and suits they could plug in, stayed warm in these airplanes because it is absolutely miserable. Um, so that's things I never do. I've, I've still, I've been flying this airplane 20, gosh, 27 years. I've flown after sunset, but I've never flown the airplane at full dark, and I never plan to. So, uh, same thing. This side is basically a carbon copy of the other side. Same with the big counterbalance, again. You know, moving back around the airplane. You can see here on the horizontal, we've got a couple different inspection panels, one on either side. And this is where all the, the cables for the trim system come in, and there's a big drum in there. They wrap around that. So when I move the control in the cockpit, it twists that drum and moves the, the actuator. Uh, this side of the airplane, we've got a much bigger panel here that we can take off for inspection that we get in there and we can lube the tail gear and inspect the tail gear, all that. This is a special fairing I put on for racing. There is a lot of pressure inside the fuselage that builds up at high speeds. So it's a reverse NACA duck, which helps suck some of the air out of the fuselage. And I was very skeptical about it when I first got it, thinking there's no way this thing does anything. But as a point of reference, when I'm flying along and I've got my hand on a stick and one on a throttle, we all wear Nomex flight suits in these airplanes now, it will suck my, my suit out between the canopy frame and the fuselage. I put those on and that stops. So there is a, that is so effective, it is mind boggling. I had no idea it would do what it does, but it actually works. It looks kind of goofy, but air coming through the fuselage is, is very draggy. So any drag I can get rid of to help me go faster or, or maintain my speed without having to put more power on the airplane is, is the goal. Aerodynamics are the name of the game here. Uh, this is a, a mast antenna. This is what I transmit and receive my radio from. This is actually an original antenna from World War II. It still works today. It works better than some of the, the modern antennas that guys put in these things. So I've only got one radio, one antenna is all I need. You'll see on the airplane through over the years, it's had various antennas in places and we've, you know, put patches on where they used to be. This is the original location for this antenna, so that's why it's right there. This, during the war, it, beside this panel, was the oxygen service port. The guys would come up and it had three big oxygen tanks that sat what, in what we call the hellhole. It's kind of hard to see, but you can, you can see the 
the way it's designed and how the mouth is a certain size and then the ducting in the back behind and above the oil cooler starts to open up and that what that does is it decelerates the air because it's it's slowing down because it's expanding goes through the radiator and then it tucks back down again and that's where we're getting our our efficiency going through the radiator this little fairing up here on top of the scoop is something I put on for racing as well. It is um, just to help clean up the air between the bottom of the wing and the top of, of the, the scoop itself. If you look at a stock P51, there's some, some air intake openings on the other side and different things to help for cockpit ventilation is one of the big things I have in it. The airplane on any given day is 30 degrees hotter in the cockpit than it is outside ambient air temperature and that's due to the cooling system so on a 90 degree day like we're expecting here in reno today it'll be 120 in the cockpit and so yeah you wind up getting really hot really quickly in this airplane plus you're underneath the greenhouse canopy which was designed on the airplane as well to be able to see enemy fighters and it's just so you're in a, uh, a greenhouse as well as having boiling water three inches underneath your feet so it, it the airplane on a hot day is is really miserable to fly so it's um, but it's one of the things that we do you know it's it's a Mustang you can't not want to go out and fly a Mustang even on I've flown on 110 degree days and just it been absolutely just yeah, it's it's brutal is all I can say as you get out of the airplane you're completely soaked you're dehydrated it's but you're flying a Mustang so it's it's an honor to be able to fly these and share them with people and if history seems to be going away right now in our modern times they're trying to erase certain things but these you can't erase these things they are they're here they're living they're breathing you know it, one of our guys said it many many years ago he said why do we have zoos you know well we have zoos so we can see living animals and things well airplanes okay they're they're not a living animal per se but they are living they're breathing they do everything so why would you have all these airplanes in museums it's it's just not right we need to come out share them with the world let them people see them hear them feel them you can hear them you know you can feel it in your chest when they go by they smell certain ways with the burnt oil and fuel and it's and they all have personalities i've flown 10 different p51s yes they're all the same they're all p51s but every one of them flies just a little bit differently or has a little bit different feel or has a, its own little idiosyncrasy they're they're unique they're like individuals they're people but not without being a person so it's it's an honor to be able to to have it and share it with people and i just hope i can continue it for the next 30 years and maybe pass it on to my son who's now three years old and that was one of the things my dad and I talked about a couple years ago it's after he was born so we've had the airplane 40 years my goal was to keep it 51 years just because of the the 51 the p51 I thought 51 would be a great number to shoot for and he and he brought up the point he's like well he says you're gonna have to keep it longer than that now to give your son the chance to fly it hopefully the EPA and the oil companies will continue to make the fuel that we run, which is 100 octane, um, and that's that's going to be one of the biggest kickers. If for whatever reason we can't get the fuel anymore, it's going to ground a lot of these airplanes until they can come up with some kind of alternative. They're high compression engines, high horsepower. They don't like low fuel octane things. It's it's no different than high test in your car versus regular. We have to run supreme in these things, and if they stop making that we're not sure what we're going to do yet so there's guys looking for development on that and things but we just right now we're not sure what we can do um, I keep that plugged up so kids don't throw things down here when we're at air shows and just keep some of the dirt and debris out 